Hey, this is Sabrina Monarch of monarchastrology.com and Magic of the Spheres podcast, bringing you the astrology forecast for March 17 to March 23rd, 2021. You can find the written version of this forecast at monarchastrology.com or get on my mailing list. And I branched out to YouTube around a year ago now to start bringing you video versions of these forecasts. And today I am in a cosmic background here because um, I'm packing up the room behind me and I figured this would be more pleasing to look at. So we began the lunar cycle uh, last week. We had a new moon in Pisces conjunct Venus and Neptune in Pisces, which was just such a beautiful transit. So we began the lunar cycle with a cosmic heart healing and this upwelling of Venusian magic. At least I hope so. I definitely felt it. And that was, that was a potential. Uh, this week, the vibe grows more Martian. It's definitely a mood shift with the sun and Venus entering Aries. The ingress into Aries from Pisces, so planets leave Pisces, move into Aries, this mood shift um, is often a shift of feeling birthed, of feeling a direction or a new willpower emerge from a place that we before felt formless. If we were not enjoying Pisces season, um, it can feel like getting our feet on land after a tumultuous seafaring journey. If we did enjoy Pisces season, it can feel like embarking on a path of action after a dip into our deepest inspirations and inner visions. I have to say this has been maybe one of my favorite Pisces seasons that, um, I mean, I'd have to like really think about it if I wanted to like rank them or something like that. But um, significantly, it was a really enjoyable Pisces season. And I think that um, navigating Piscean weather to me feels like, you know, we can go to learning about different like spiritual kind of opening practices or, you know, I did have like a moment, I think it was still Aquarius season or maybe Pisces season was just beginning and I just felt um, overwhelmed in a negative way. And then I got a reading from my friend, Stephanie an Akashic records reading and like a mentor kind of session. And she helped me see my situation differently. And then after that things changed. So I have had that experience really where like talking to psychics or talking to mystics or just getting that like perception shift uh, when things feel confusing or unknown or in flux um, can help like go from thrashing at sea <laughs> to surfing. Um, and I feel like maybe as time goes on, you know, I'll keep thinking about ways to talk about how to engage Pisces and how to engage Pisces magic um, so that we can experience that um, best side of it possible. And that's really also something that I aim to bring in general when I talk about astrology is how can we participate with these transits to be in relationship with them to therefore enjoy ourselves through life um, as opposed to seeing transits as, you know, these neutral or negative things that we need to mitigate the effects of. It's like, well, what's the weather like and how can we play with this weather? So that's important to me. And um, yeah, so I wonder, you know, feel free to let me know in the comments uh, how your Pisces season was. And if you learned anything about Pisces, I'd be curious to hear, learned anything about yourself through this season. Um, so I may as well say too, that if you're here, please like this video and leave a comment um, at any point throughout. Let me know what you think and subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell so that you know when new videos come out. So back to um, the forecast for next week um, or this week. When contemplating Aries or Mars, it reminds me of how life-giving it is to have positive relationships with all of the archetypes. Many people have trouble with Mars. Mars relates to war and historically humans have not outgrown warfare, just as Mars has not left the archetypal pantheon. Mars relates to what gets our blood pumping through our veins, what arouses us in all sense of the word, what calls us to attention and initiation, and what activates us. I have like 
many idealistic thoughts about things in general, but about Mars as well. I think of, there was this one time I was at a Kundalini yoga festival and the someone on stage had everyone like put their hand to their hearts and like um, essentially make this certain kind of commitment. There was something kind of very um, martial in that energy that I felt. And while it was happening and everyone here is just like doing Kundalini yoga and vibing out and it's like such a peaceful or kind of like magical place, that moment of all of us like standing up straight, putting our hands to our hearts and like devoting ourselves to something felt so Martian. And I, I thought about people who do that to a flag of their country, right? And how, what it means to kind of activate Mars but for higher causes or higher forms of service. And that essentially we, we like Martian energy. We wouldn't still be doing this stuff as human if there wasn't a part of us that like got something from it. If there wasn't a part of us that was impulsively drawn to it. And so I think that that energy of really, you know, having a cause or having a mission or having a direction or having a noble journey or a hero's quest, like excites people. And so finding a way to relate with that energy that is increasingly noble, um, as opposed to small minded or, you know, perpetuating unnecessary suffering or violence. I've always found it more useful and more beneficial in the long run to develop a meaningful relationship with an archetype, as opposed to simply judging it, not liking it or fearing it, or just, you know, waiting for it to stop transiting us or waiting for it to get of a sign or whatever, um, to play with it instead, right? To befriend it instead. If we consider our relationship with Mars, we have to think about what defense means to us, what assertiveness means to us, and how we protect and how we pursue. Where we don't have skills or sharpened skills for meeting and working through conflict, life will show us. It can take the form of saying yes to things and we don't mean it or not bringing something up that may need to be addressed. Or if we are more unconscious about how we express Mars, it can also look like encountering conflict everywhere we go and we didn't intend it, or somehow it's everyone else's problem. Whatever our circumstances or proclivities, working with Mars is learning about action and how we create sovereignty in a way that is appropriate for us and our individual circumstances and dharma and all of that. The warrior does not just face external obstacles out there, but also internal ones like having the courage to really face oneself, having the courage to take a leap. I see strong Martian energy all the time in people in ways that has nothing to do with conventional war. It may take the form of a dancer, an entrepreneur, any kind of go-getter, or also the person who knows how to directly name what they want or assert their needs in a moment of conflict. At heart, Martians know how to stand up for themselves or they are learning. And once they feel put together or set in that way, they often direct their life force to service, using their strength in whatever form that takes for them to help others. So I'll get into our week in further detail, transit by transit, after a few announcements. One is that you can sign up for my mailing list to receive these to your inbox every week. It's a great way to stay in touch. I also send out you know, updates about upcoming offerings. Recently, I sent out like a, a call for research and I was pretty overwhelmed with the responses. I'm getting back to people slowly on that. Um, but that was like, you know, a mailing list, you know, mailing list people find out about things first. Um, same as like when my books open for astrology readings, um, I keep you in the know about my courses that are coming out and you get the forecast every week. 
So the link for that is in the notes. And you can also find me on Instagram at Sabrina Monarch. That's another place that I like to express and interact with people. Um, so go find me there. My Evolutionary Astrology Intensive is beginning again, May 10th um, of 2021. And this is learning like the foundations to evolutionary astrology, which is a Pluto form of astrology. Pluto-based astrology relates a lot with the lunar nodes. It's a lot about our karma, what we bring into this life, and essentially how we um, act into our dharma. So how we understand what our patterns are and then how to work with that to live our best life, essentially. Um, it's pretty far reaching the content in this course we go into a deep dive about the deeper evolutionary meanings of all of the signs as well as the planets and how to put things together by sign and house and aspect and a lot of the technical stuff as it also folds into this you know truly like a wisdom school evolutionary astrology is and this is also a community experience the classes are pre-recorded like the modules are and then we meet once a week as a group to talk about it and to get to know each other. And it culminates in reading our own charts as a group. Um, so I really enjoy like the, the amazing groups of people that form for this um, and just, you know, being brought together by this really deep inquiry about astrology. So if you vibe with these forecasts or the podcast, um, the content that I put out in general, that's a pretty good um, indicator that you'll like the content of this course. Um, sharing astrology with people has become something that I'm just so passionate about. And like, it's really just fun and magical um, and something that I just so deeply value getting to do. So if you want to learn more about this course, you can check the notes um, and enrollment's currently open. So you can read more about it, read student testimonials and enroll. I also have a new episode of Magic of the Spheres podcast called Relating to Time, the Aura of a Moment with Drew Levanti, where we talked about electional astrology, which is something that Drew is a wizard at. This is the astrology of selecting times for particular um, goals or things that you're initiating. And we talked about the, you know, something that I've like been really intrigued by that I feel like Drew introduced me to, or like showed, you know, opened a window to was the, the nature of hourly time, like how much it actually matters where the ascendant is not just in a natal chart, but at any given moment, like right now, the quality of the ascendant is relating to the experience that I'm having, say recording this video or, um, you know, whatever else it is that I may be doing at a given moment and to explore the different kinds of qualities that a moment carries with it into the future based on the, the mode of the ascendant. So this is going to be like a deeper dive into mutable, into cardinal, into fixed and how that shows up as a quality. So this was a really great conversation. Um, you can tune into that on Magic of the Spheres podcast. And I will get back to the forecast now. So on March 18th, 2021, Venus in 26 degrees of Pisces will sextile Pluto in 26 degrees of Capricorn at 10.20 a.m. Pacific. Sometimes the initial spark for an opening process, so opening, you know, Venusian receptivity, willingness to receive, willingness to experience, the openness that we feel to life. So sometimes the initial spark for an opening is felt as aversion or jealousy, feeling triggered by someone else's expression because it reflects a place inside of us that we feel more lack or latency. When we have an intense and challenging response to something which we also find beautiful or pleasing, this can be an auger that we are ready to integrate or up-level a powerful aspect of ourselves. By noticing the sensation and extending kindness and compassion to ourselves in that sensation, 
we can also inquire more deeply into the value or desire that is being expressed in the encounter. What did this encounter symbolize? Then we can see if we are willing to open to that desire or experience from within in the true form it wants to show up for us as opposed to the very specific way it shows up for another person, right? Because we are not other people. We do not have their same life experience, their same karma, their same life path. So when we see them in a certain state of being that we want to also experience, our way to that is going to be unique to ourselves and our karmas and our life purpose. So it may not be an exact mirror copy of what that person is doing, but that person being in their essence or expressing themselves in some way is waking up a part of ourselves. And so figuring out what is this energy that's awakening inside of me and how does it want to express for me? And, you know, at the first most superficial level, it's just feeling jealous. <laughs> it's just feeling jealous, you know, feeling perturbed and disturbed. Um, at a deeper level, it's like, well, what's going on here? And finding that deeper thread is where the magic is. On March 20th, 2021, the sun enters Aries at 2.37 a.m. Pacific. Aries can be likened to answering the call for adventure in the hero's journey. Aries is where we step out, take a leap, do something. We aren't just sitting at home waiting for life to happen for or to us. It is notable that this is the first Aries season in a few years where the sun will not make hard aspects to Saturn and Capricorn now that Saturn has moved into Aquarius. And this Aries season, all the planets are direct, no retrogrades. There's been um, some years in the past where I was starting to correlate April with this like Pluto Saturn retrograde situation. Like Pluto was stationing retrograde in April for some time. Um, but I looked and throughout Aries season, everything is direct. Aries is so much about forward motion, going for it, doing it, being the first. These skies look like there is less potentially standing in the way of that aspect of Aries nature. Let's just be clear too. Retrogrades like spark this kind of aversion in people like, oh no, <laughs> retrograde or retrogrades are bad. It's really not that way. Um, but retrogrades do emphasize going back over something. So for writing, it's going back over and editing it, which can actually yield more refined craft, right? Um, but if we're really wanting to just go for it and do a thing and not have to go back and do the thing over again, then, you know, having no retrogrades uh, is kind of like in alignment with that. Retrogrades bring us more inward, more reflective, um, more in like a space of reviewing. We do have Chiron in Aries. Uh, it's there for a long period of time, but it, it will be there all of Aries season. So if we are feeling some inhibitions around our will or around expressing ourself or around trying something new. I mean, that's an Aries experience in of itself is like, it is a sign of bravery and courage, but what's the flip side of that <laughs> is fear and being scared. So a lot of um, being brave, like sometimes one is naive. They don't even see an issue with something and they just go for it. Sometimes they, they do know what they're signing up for, but they have the courage to do the thing anyway. So Chiron and Aries might relate to, you know, some activations around our personal sense of, you know, I can do it versus I feel inhibited. If on the other hand, we lack forethought or consciousness in a place that we really could use it, there may be activations this month around thinking before we act. I sometimes think of Aries as like there's a kind of special grace or bubble that is extended to one who acts courageously and isn't aware of maybe like 
oh, this might not be smart, <laughs> you know, like there's a certain kind of like, okay, the angels are there. When we make a decision that we kind of know, like we're getting all the kind of internal, like, no, this isn't smart. I know better. And we do it. I think that it's a little bit more of a harsher experience. Um, right. And so it's, it's super nuanced, you know, figuring out what your relationship is to your sense of courage and how, you know, you know, the difference between like intuition and fear, you know, sometimes people ask about that one thing, um, clearing fear from one's consciousness as much as possible and entering into a more expansive state of being and like really working with expansion as a kind of compass for one's actions. You can feel when it's true deeply to go for something. And when you just have this kind of static chatter or noise about all your fears or anxieties about it versus when you actually have some, some wisdom there and maybe before leaping, you're going to create some, something for that container. So like someone who is not just jumping off the cliff, but lapelling with a rope that they tied to something at the top of the cliff where you take an educated risk. That's a possibility. But more often than not, if we're talking about Aries, we're talking about not necessarily knowing the full implications of the situation, but taking the leap anyway. So it's like that call to quit your job and do the entrepreneurial thing, even though you don't know if it's going to be successful or the call to dive into a relationship that you feel a lot of chemistry and uh, it feels really good and it feels right. And even though you're scared, you're going to go for it. Those kinds of moments in life where the momentum is there to do a thing <laughs> and it requires that kind of uh, jumping, taking a leap kind of thing with Aries season. Aries also relates to the ways that we learn through doing that some forms of greater refinement may be accessible only through throwing ourselves into the arena. So Aries and Virgo form an inconjunct. They have like a special critical adjustment aspect is what I call the inconjunct or the quincunx. I'm not the first person to call it that, the critical adjustment. Um, and so Virgo is like very about like perfecting and refining and craft. And Aries is like just leaping, doing the thing. And um, sometimes if we're too worried about having everything perfect and having everything lined up before we take the leap, we never end up taking the leap because the refinement process is literally infinite, as opposed to stepping out, trying the thing, getting on the path, and then learning as we go. Um, there's certain things we're only going to learn through experience and that we can't preemptively meditate on and be like thoroughly ready, right? It's like, we just have to learn through the experience. And Aries is like the king of that. Aries necessarily highlights courage and bravery. The opposite, opposite side of that coin is fear and inhibition. In Aries experience, having a goal or a mission can be an alchemical process because when focusing on a finish line and having one's head in the game, one may feel spiritually or emotionally resourced to actually unpack one's fears and to quickly confront and transform them. You know, quickly, relatively speaking, however you want to put that in a frame of time. But when you know that you're going to go for something, it activates us differently than if we're still waffling about whether or not we're going to do it. While a finish line is an alchemical agent for an Aries, so something to aspire to, we may also remember that the joy is the journey of discovering oneself through the act of becoming oneself. Aries brings a great deal of attention to the self and the question of who am I? Consider the ways that having a goal or a mission creates an abundance of experience, learning, and self-awareness for you. You know, it's really interesting. Like, we don't think of being selfish or self-centered or self-absorbed as positive. But the sun relates to generosity and magnanimity. 
And the reality is that when people invest deeply in themselves and that question of who am I, and they know their strengths and they know their cutting edge and they work through their challenges and they've done that kind of like inner exploration, it turns into a lot of generosity in relationship. It's not just about the self. It's actually bringing a very fully fleshed out self to relationship. So Aries season is a great time to think about that kind of personal mythos, personal hero's journey, um, and that like, you know, who are you kind of question. And not just even uncovering who you are inherently, because that's part of it too, but who are you creating? Because we also create ourselves through the ways that we participate with life and through the, the goals that we set out, the intentions that we create and the way that we draw ourselves to that. March 21st, 2021, Venus enters Aries at 7.16 a.m. Pacific. Venus will stay in Aries until April 14th, 2021. Venus and Aries can reveal the pursuer side of Venus. This is a Venus that goes directly for what she wants. Many business teachings that I find value in de-glorify the hustle and the hustle mentality. Hustling is not sustainable. It's nice to know how to create abundance in one's life without having to work so hard all of the time. So while this is true, let's look at a few things, right? There's a lot of also like um, ethos around not considering hard work as social capital. Like being exhausted is not a social status symbol. Like, oh, I worked so hard um, that we don't have to work ourselves to the ground. We don't have to work harder than we need to to prove anything to ourselves. Yes, yes, that is all true. And the startup energy that Aries is can sometimes like really burn bright and that can look like hustling. So with Venus and Aries, let's examine the romance of the sprint, the romance of the launch, the romance, dare I say, of the hustle. Again, it's not exactly sustainable and it may not be ideal as a way to live all of the time but when the energy is there, this energy initiates so much. So imagine sometimes we're, we're already in the hustle mentality. And so we get the ethos coming in of like, oh, you don't have to work so hard. And then, you know, okay, I can relax, right? But what if that energy of life force that's like, we're, it's needed, that life force to start and initiate something, but you don't want to do it because you've heard that that's like not good to do. So now there's shame around it or something like that. So I want to kind of like just bring some inquiry into what is the value of this potentially unsustainable energy and where is it appropriate? Um, right? Like to even just give ourselves permission to be fluid and adaptable in our personality or in our methods. This is what I love about astrology where it's like, not everyone needs Gemini medicine, right? And sometimes that's exactly what someone needs. It's not universal. Um, it's related to what would be right for us. So here's some examples of like what comes to mind for Venus and Aries. I knew a Venus and Aries woman who was extremely direct about flirting and meeting people. She was down to find or meet lovers anywhere at like conventional places to meet people like parties, but also just like on the street or at the grocery store. Uh, the setting didn't really matter. If she felt an energy or a vibe or attraction, she would just stare them down and flirt with them. And not all of these encounters were positive, some explosive, but the last person she stared down and met this way, she ended up marrying and their relationship is passionate. The initial flames and sparks she created eventually created a sustainable wildfire or a sustainable fire, I should say. When I listened to interviews with business people on podcasts who 
may be well established or thriving now, they often have stories of the ways that they hustled. And while they grew out of those original methods, which were high cost when it comes to energy or time, it's like they have stars in their eyes when they talk about it. Because at the end of the day, it was fun. It was fun to create something out of nothing and to be willing to do whatever it took right? To be that like driven and goal oriented and just stoked that you were willing to take on some heroic tasks that, you know, the kind of end game there is like, I'm not going to have to do this every day for the rest of my life, but I'm going to throw down right now because this is like planting some seeds. And when these seeds sprout, the business is going to take off and then I'm going to find new ways to work that aren't so high cost in my personal energy and time. But that process of throwing down at the very beginning may not be bypassed. Aries is a startup energy and the startup is high energy. It's cardinal fire. It's a burst of fire. It can be through experimentation or trying new things that we gain experiences from which we gain a greater sense of wisdom or direction. These early hustle stories are often people who wanted to accomplish something, but they had no idea how. They hadn't done it before. So they tried things out to learn about the path and about themselves. And as a byproduct of the experiments, they met people had encounters and met mentors. And then a refinement process emerged that Virgo quincunx. So consider if there is a new direction or opening or a new direction opening for you in which you know what you want, but you don't know how to get there yet. What romances do you afford to your beginnings? As for the hustle, I think that energies have their time and place. Let's say someone has been hustling for a while. It may then be a new experience to learn how to slow down and run their enterprise in a way that affords them time and space for relaxation and integration. It's actually, it's like a new skill. If you've been hustling, learning how to stop and change is like learning a new skill. And this is important to learn given that the hustle isn't sustainable. Energetically, Aries has a go-getter energy and is a battering ram. Aries will go forward in a direction until they're tired, then they'll rest, and then they'll do it again. So in the realm of relating to our desires, Venus, we might contemplate how we relate with the startup energy, Aries, of our desire. And if we relate to our own momentum, how we go for it, or do we suppress it? And at deeper levels in the game of whatever game we're playing, how we refine that momentum and how we entertain new goals, perhaps, that are even more life enhancing than the methods and goals of our past. That's part of the hero's journey. That's part of like any time you listen to someone's life story on a podcast, like who's really successful or whatever. They tried some things, they learned, and they pivoted, and they like moved their energy into new pursuits through gaining experience and through gaining knowledge. Um, and it's easy to be like, oh, I was like doing the wrong thing all of that time, and now I know, but it's like through doing the wrong thing, you learned, <laughs> you learned by doing. So keeping that in mind, like when we, when we're fresh in some way, when we're new to something that, that is completely a whole, a holistic part of the equation of learning. Mercury in eight degrees of Pisces will sextile Uranus in eight degrees of Taurus at 4.35 PM that same day. Just letting you know, I didn't write about that one. And then Mars in 10 degrees of Gemini will trine Saturn in 10 degrees of Aquarius at 7.35 p.m. Pacific. Mars and Saturn harmonizing in air signs, so air relating to ideas, intellect, and communication. And Mars, our 
Mars and Saturn are like, you know, I never looked at them this way with evolutionary astrology until I broadened to studying other branches of astrology, but Mars and Saturn are called malefics. Um, it was really helpful for me to not have that filter at all for years when interacting with them. Just like I was talking about Mars at the beginning and like people have difficulty with Mars, but how do we relate? Same with Saturn. People talk about Saturn like it's a he, some old grumpy man in the sky punishing us. And that's just like not who Saturn is, you know? Um, and it's one way that we can imagine or mythologize Saturn, but Saturn is like at a deeper level, the cause and effect principle of reality. So if for a time, socially, severe punishment was a way that the law was upheld, then there was maybe a connection between social norms and Saturn and convention and like punishment. Um, relating with Saturn intrapsychically, it's like, how do we create foundations that support us as opposed to, do we like whip ourselves into shape and try to motivate ourselves with shame? right? Like these are different ways of relating. So that being said, Mars and Saturn are like, um, like when you go out into nature, seeing plants that have thorns, you know, or like, like that they're kind of, you know, can relate to the defense structures, um, or some of the boundary creating structures, um, or energies in the universe. So we got Mars and Saturn harmonizing in the air signs. So I'm thinking like, what does that look like for ideas at this time? And it could correspond with us contacting or being the conduit for ideas which are clarifying ideas of impact. You know, feeling like called out by the stars. <laughs> that was um, a phrase someone just sent me over email, so it's fresh in my mind. But like when you read something and you feel called out by it, or when you get a reflection from someone that kind of hits, even if it wasn't intended maliciously, uh, but it's just a reflection. You're like, ooh, like I felt that. Like that was impactful. That clarifies something for me, right? It calls into consideration how we relate to these things responsibly. And when we take the responsibility to deliver judgment, right? Like, that's a thing. <laughs> like I was, hmm, I want to be, get my thought clear on this. If we observe someone's behavior and we think that they are wrong, there is the question of, are we the arbiter of that? Are we the judge of that? And if we do decide to make ourselves the judge of that, what does that mean? Is that an assignment? Is that an embodiment that we want to take on? Is it our responsibility? I don't have an answer, but I do think it's a good thing to reflect upon because it's very serious actually to take that level of responsibility. Internally, this could look like epiphanies or realizations that break or interrupt a pattern of complacency or collusion. For example, if we've been saying yes to something we're not actually available for, and this could be the start of clarity in saying no, right? So drawing a boundary, severing, oh, I've been like making myself nebulously available for this thing, but it's actually not correct for me. No, that clarity coming upon us of, wait a minute, this is not correct for me. And then taking an action to reflect that new knowledge. So back to that, you know, inquiry around, are we the arbiters? Mars and Saturn together express differently when there is consent in the relationship or container. As example, the friend who tells you a hard truth because you are willing to hear it and you trust them. 
or the coach who reflects back to you something that you haven't been able to see clearly yourself. And they do so because that is the role they are playing in the situation and they are doing it with love. Or in conversation, asking someone what kind of feedback they want. Do they just want to be listened to or do they want advice? So as someone who, you know, at one point I had this like spiritual awakening and overnight I felt like a psychic and I felt like I could see things and I had to tell people what I saw. Creating a channels like this where I can share my ideas and people can opt in by choice has been a way for me to engage consent as opposed to just saying things out in the street or um, confronting people with my psychic visions for them who didn't want to hear it, right? Um, having friends where we can talk at that level and I let them know I have a download for you. Like, do you want to hear it? Right? As opposed to just saying it. <laughs> As opposed to bringing my ideas to challenge people in the wrong environment for me, as opposed to just creating my own space or my own container. And I found a lot of value in that. I found a lot of clarity in that. And I think that it does become an individual Dharma skillful life, you know, question of how do you want to have impact in this reality? What is your responsibility for having impact? And what are the ways that you can do that, perhaps with the right container? And so sometimes, like this week, that could be as simple as if you have a big conversation that you want to have with someone, asking them if they have space to talk about it, or if you want to make a space and time for it, as opposed to just off-gassing or dumping it at an inopportune time where there was no container. You see what I mean? Or are you going around rampantly giving people unsolicited advice? And why? Is that transmission that's coming through you have a way to express itself perhaps more abundantly with people that are ready or called for that kind of feedback? Where would you be best situated? Those kinds of questions with Mars and Saturn. March 23rd, 2021. Mercury in 11 degrees of Pisces will square Mars in 11 degrees of Gemini at 8.26 p.m. Pacific. Mars in Gemini has already related to lively conversation and the potential for more aggression in the verbal or communicative field than normal. Aggression or just enthusiasm, like people are excited to talk and that can be like very, um, you know, mutually just like vibing or it can be like a little bit more chaotic and like competitive. Mercury Mars contacts create a similar experience as Mars and Gemini, Mars in a Mercury ruled sign. It is a debate aspect, Mercury Mars. During Mercury Mars time period, situations and conversations can constellate where it feels competitive or hard to get a word in, or like people are interrupting and talking over each other. We might want to be conscientious about this dynamic just to notice it. At a nervous system level, this could be a good time for working with de-escalating the inflammation that we feel around ideas or words. We do not have to be in full-on trauma response or hypervigilance to be effective in dealing with conflict. Sometimes this can actually work against meaningful conflict resolution if we stay in that response or are quick to be snapped into it at a time that is overly inflamed. When we are highly activated or inflamed by some stressor, it's like the body gets turned into a go mode weapon. 
So part of responsibly wielding our own capacity for violence, if we want to look at it that way, you know, if you just snap at someone, that was like a, an energy that you just unleashed. And so what is it like to know how to circulate that activation through the body and have a relationship with being activated as opposed to just having it happen to us in a way that we don't feel like we're in control of? So being in relationship with our own nervous system and stressors and learning how to increasingly have bandwidth or to self-regulate actually relates to being more effectual. So for me, when I talk about nervous system stuff, some, some teachings are like directly related to like certain nerves or like breath work or like there's different, many different ways to enter this conversation of how to regulate the nervous system. For me, a lot of it has been in relationship with my own body and just like my own level of self-awareness and feeling into noticing when I'm getting activated, when I'm getting like a charged emotional response to something and being in the process of self-soothing and changing that charge from within before I even do anything. And to me, that's felt like a kind of nervous system process. Even in terms of like first starting to share things online, I would feel very activated afterwards. And I'd have to like soothe myself to just hold the sensation of having expressed myself publicly. So everyone has their own things, you know, like um, what are the things in your reality, the little buzzers, where if you hit that boundary of your nervous system's comfort level, you get into a stress response or it's like, a, zzz, you know, <laughs> or you're starting to have like anxiety come up. Those are spaces where by being aware of what those things are and like slowly kind of coaxing more range in those spaces, you get to have access to those places within yourself. So when I was writing about this, it occurred to me, like, I would love to have some like cool, like, you know, breathe through one nostril, do this kind of tool to offer you at a practical level. Um, but I think I'm actually just really pointing to a, an opening for conversation around nervous system healing or nervous system soothing. Um, and I think that we all kind of find our ways into modalities that help us, um, but at the simplest level, I think it does come down to holding ourselves. And so when you're upset, reflecting back to yourself with kindness that you're upset. Like, oh, I see that you're, you're really feeling this. What's going on, you know? And like being compassionate or tending to yourself um, so that, you're caring for yourself even when you're not okay, right? As opposed to judging yourself or splitting off from yourself or getting mad at yourself or judging yourself for having an experience that's negative. That's where I'd start. For experiences like this kind of, okay, nervous system stressor situation, this is why in addition to loving vibrational magic, so this is positivity or raising one's vibration and the like, creating your reality, all of these kind of quantum teachings. I also love shadow work and deep inner work. When we're upset, there's parts of ourselves potentially that you know we can pay attention to if we make it us versus them or us versus the world or us versus the trigger, this can keep us in a, a victimized state or a victim mentality. It is often more transformative to understand our role in the situation and shift our interior reality, nourish our own nervous system and learn something about ourselves. It's not about what is fair or who is right or who's wrong but whether we have a reactive victimized relationship with life or an empowered, increasingly sober relationship 
with conflict and our capacity to move through it with increasing lucidity. And so it's not about dreaming the conflict away. Sometimes conflict is imaginary and we realize that through spiritual work that we were making a problem out of nothing. And sometimes there really is something that needs to be addressed and the question of how to address it lucidly really calls upon an inner maturity. Consider how you process being upset, how you hold the sensations, how you come back to yourself and presence with yourself, validate yourself like you would care for a child or your inner child and transform and move the energy. It's easier to move something when we accept it versus when we're fighting it. So often if you're having a really challenging experience, accepting it and being compassionate for it is part of what loosens it. Loosens it. If you're upset about being upset, you know, it creates a snowball effect. So just remember, life itself is always teaching us. The transits are always walking with us. And so even when things are happening that we feel aversion or activation to, that may also be happening to clarify for us what we desire and who we are. So that felt important to mention because of the Mercury Mars square. It feels like that may be in the field a little bit, but also because it's such a Martian week. So that's where a lot of these meditations were being sourced from. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments, um, what resonated with you, um, or if you have any questions for me um, or on these ideas, I do read them and um, it's good to know. It helps me um, formate, formulate my ideas as well. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. I hope that you have a beautiful week um, and some a deepening of your friendship with Mars uh, with ease and grace. Much love.